Hello, greetings, uh, members of the Harvard community. It is so wonderful to be back with you today uh, for our closing session. Um, I hope that you all have enjoyed the uh, the. Uh, the forum as much as I have. Um, there have been so many nuggets and takeaways, which we'll talk about after we close with our final session. Um, I could not be more excited for this conversation. At the intersection of social justice, political empowerment, human development, and the cultural arts, one will find Latasha Brown. As a catalyst for change, thought leader and social strategist. Her national and global efforts have been known to organize, inspire and catapult people into action, not just lip service, enabling them to build power and wealth for themselves and their community. There is no better person to close the inaugural EDIB forum and challenge us to reimagine our community more than Latasha Brown. She is also a member of the Harvard community, and we are thrilled that she's joining us today. She's an award-winning organizer, philanthropic consultant, political strategist, and jazz singer with over 20 years of experience working in the nonprofit and philanthropy sectors on a wide variety of issues related to political empowerment, social justice, economic development, leadership development, wealth creation, and civil rights. She's a co-founder of the Black Voters Matter Fund, a power building Southern based civic engagement organization that played an instrumental role in the 2017 Alabama U.S. Senate race. Ms. Brown is the founding project director of Grantmakers for Southern Progress and is principal owner of Truth Speaks Consulting Incorporated, a philanthropy advisory consulting firm in Atlanta, Georgia, and she's been on campus as part of our Harvard community um, over in HKS um, for I think almost the last three years now. Now moderating this timely and important discussion is Pacent Matter. Pacent is an Egyptian Canadian journalist, writer, and radio audio producer. She was born in Alexandria, Egypt, and raised between Toronto, Saudi Arabia, and Dubai. She spent 10 years at the CBC, where she was a longtime producer on The Current, with then-host Anna Maria Tremonti, where much of her coverage focused on race and racism, police brutality, the Arab Spring, migration and refugees, pop culture, and more. She produced documentaries from the floods of Calgary, Alberta in 2012, the streets of Baltimore's protests for Freddie Gray in 2015, and from the homes of Yazidi women who fled Iraq for Toronto after surviving sexual slavery at the hands of Daesh. In 2020, she wrote about her experience with media in a walrus piece called uh, in a walrus piece, which won National Magazine Award in 2021 and a Canadian Online Publishing Award in 2022. If you haven't had an opportunity to read her work, I am telling you, read it, it will change your life. She is currently a Neiman Foundation for Journalism Fellow at Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I could not be more excited to have these two thought leaders, thinkers, um, and just overall phenomenal women closing us out today. With that said, without further ado, uh, present over to you and Latasha. Greetings. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you to my Harvard community for having me here today on the, to be a part of this historic inaugural conference. You know, there's a lot of things that I think that as we're thinking about the moment that we find ourselves in, I'd love to, for us to really reflect on where we are, where we've been and where we got to go. You know, when I think about it, what comes to mind to me um, is a song. You know, I think about, oh, freedom, oh, freedom, oh, freedom over me, over me. And before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. You know, I wanted to start with that song because when you think about that song, you know, we hear that song as a call out to what people are experiencing. But what's really phenomenal about that song is it really is about imagination. It is really about a people who at the time, 
you know, at were enslaved and were considered less um, than even human beings. But there was something in them that they recognized that they were deserving of something greater, that their agency and their humanity was opening up a space for them to know that at the end of the day, I have the right to be free, that there is something, right, that is called freedom, that I can express the fullness of my humanity that I am deserving of and that I have agency to seek and to fight for. And I am actually willing to give my life for this thing called freedom. And so what that requires for to actually base in that, what requires for people who may have not seen freedom in the same sense of what they were, what, what, what we think of it now, they were imagining that they literally had to have a radical reimagination that actually supersede what you see in their what their current in, um, circumstance, that they actually had to have a belief in something that was greater, that wasn't just about what I see in the natural, in the now, but what I can see in the future. And so given that, what I often do every single time I speak, it doesn't matter whether I'm in a college campus, whether I'm in a community, I often take people through an exercise. Almost all the time, I take people through an exercise. And I'm going to ask the community to join me in this as well. What I'm going to ask you to do is wherever you are, and some of you uh, in the Harvard community have probably seen me do this before. But what I'm going to ask you to do in this moment is I'm going to ask you to get in the space to kind of get centered. I want you to get centered and get grounded. I want you to kind of clear your mind. I would like for you, I'm going to ask you two questions and I want you to close your eyes and I'm going to ask you these two questions. And as you close your eyes, I want you to hear the questions with your heart, not with your head. Like let the question sit in the question and ponder on it. And then I'm going to ask you um, to open your eyes. So please close your eyes, get, get settled and close your eyes. My first question to you is, what would America look like without racism? What would this nation look like without racism? And my second question to you is, what a, would a world look like that all human beings felt valued and respected? What would a world look like where all human beings felt valued and respected? Now open your eyes. Now I don't know, of course, because there's no way for me to engage in this moment. I don't know whether you were able to see anything. I don't know if you had any thought, you know, when I go and speak wherever I am, I ask people, uh, particularly if it's in person, how many of you have been asked that question before? 99%, oftentimes, even as close to in many rooms I'm in, no one has ever been asked that question before. The question of what would America look like without racism? And the reason why that is important, you know, I often like to reference, there is nothing that has been brought to, brought into physical world and the physical being without first being envisioned. You know, I have a pen in my hand. Someone had to envision this pen. I have a bracelet. Someone had to envision this bracelet. Even as we think about in the academy, you know, there's nothing that has been brought forth. Someone had a vision that there would be a place of higher learning. Someone had a vision that there would be a library. Someone had a vision of a classroom. And so there's nothing that has been brought into being in the physical world that wasn't first envisioned. And I'm raising that because as we are talking about how are we going to deal with um, racism, how are we going to uproot racism, how are we going to deal with diversity and inclusion and justice, it is going to require us to go to a place that we most of us have never gone. We're going to have to go deep into our imagination around what are the possibilities that exist when people are able to operate in the fullness of their being. And that is going to require us literally taking some time not to respond to just what currently exists, but it's going, we're going to have to take some time to radically reimagine what the possibilities exist, right? What are the possibilities around what this nation, not only that we need to get to that point, but what is the vision of what this nation will look like? You know, oftentimes it is our vision and that's why imagination is so important that allows us to transcend our current circumstance. It allows us to see from a broader lens. It allows us to go into a space that is boundaryless. And so if a moment in time that, yes, we're all grant, we're all grounded in an experience that we have to literally keep our keep our, our mind and, and focus on how we navigate what we're currently experiencing. But we also as we are creating, as we are evolving right as a human race, as we are evolving as a nation, it is going to be impossible 
to do that if we're not really tapping into the vastness of our imaginations or taking the time to do that. And so I say that because I want to just leave with a couple of thoughts around what I think in this moment that are some key lessons. I call them kind of some key lessons uh, that I have learned in my journey. Part of what I believe that when we look at the totality of what we're experiencing politically, most of my work, many of you may know me, um, know my political work. I have been a part of and founded an organization called Black Voters Matter Fund. And we've done a lot of work around elections, around everything from uh, voting registration, to engaging people in the process, to actually advocating for voting rights, to particularly putting in infrastructure and building out an ecosystem for people to get engaged in. You know, but it's really often when I tell people my ultimate goal, although I am a pro-democracy person, I am a democracy organizer, that's who I am, you know, that my ultimate goal is not democracy. My ultimate goal is the advancement of humanity. I see, to, I see democracy as a means to an end, not an end in itself. And so to the extent that I am engaged in this process around voting, it is around, it is literally driven by my imagination that if people are engaged in the process, that if our humanity is honored, that if we're given the opportunity to operate in the fullness of our agency and to imagine and create policy that comes out of a place of what it is that we desire, not just a few people who are see themselves as a ruling class desire, that that opens up the space for us to recreate our world. It opens up a space for us to recreate how we move forward as a nation, as a global community. And so it is in that imagination that I draw my strength from the work that I'm doing right now, currently. Um, currently, it's also in that space that even those things that see what I've learned is that those things that have appeared that they have been negative, those things that have appeared, I, 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 case in point would be voter suppression, that a lot of people I often ask me, you know, aren't you tired? How do you how do you continue to fight with vo voter uh, voter uh, suppression? How do you continue to do that over and over again? This has been a long, and this has been, y'all, this has been a very, very long political se um, season, right? But the, the truth of the matter is what drives me is not beating the voter suppression. What drives me is what I know is on the other side. It is creating an inclusive and an equitable and a just democracy that I believe that all human beings deserve. It doesn't matter whether you are, are a on, on the left or the right or conservative or liberal. All those are labels. Ultimately, how I identify myself is that I am a human being and that in me being a human being, I am able to recognize the humanity in others because I lean into my own humanity. And sometimes that requires me to be able to fight from a place of yes, how do we maneuver and navigate through the waters of what we're dealing with, the political waters that we're dealing with now, recognizing that the ultimate goal is to shift the political landscape, to be something different, to be something better, to be something at a higher level. And that is gonna require us to do a couple of things. And so a couple of lessons that I'll just kind of share is one, we have to move and as we're thinking about how do we tap into our imaginations, we're going to have to move from this idea of being transactional transactional in our relationships with each other, transactional as institutions, transactional as we are engaged in this political process. We're going to have to think in a mind of how can we be transformed? That ultimately that we move from the context of being transactional and transformative. The work that I do with Black Voters Matter, part of what we made a conscious choice, that the work that we would do would not be just simply, we're going to engage people, round folks up and tell them to vote. That ultimately that we don't believe that the change is just going to come from voting. I'm the first person to say that in my organization is named Black Voters Matter, right? And so while I understand the power and the impact of voting, I also understand and I'm aware of the limitations of it. And because of that, what I recognize as we are organizing, we are organizing from a context that is not just about an election, that is not just about candidates, it's not even about a political party. It is how do we create an infrastructure and an ecosystem that will literally lead itself to creating transformative change in our communities and in this nation. And so the first lesson that I've learned and I think we have to think about as we're tapping to our imagination, that the change that we want to see, we have to really get beyond the transaction of just actions and steps to get there. And we're going to have to hold a vision that is transformative so that our actions are in, in, in fact informed and guided by the transformational vision, not just the vision that is related to the transactions. The second lesson is really that I think it's important for us to look at 
oftentimes we talk about democracy in this nation, right? And that absolutely, you know, there are elements of democracy in this nation, but we have to also have the courage to be honest that we do not have the kind of democratic infrastructure to lend itself to pluralism. It is going to take us making some tremendous change in this nation. And in order to do that, we're going to have to start looking at democracy, not just as a propaganda point. We're going to have to look at democracy as a principle. It has to become a core value in this nation. It's going to have to be a core value for us that we recognize that just because you and I may have a political difference around policy, that I that my goal isn't to destroy you. My goal isn't to make sure that I erase your voice, that you have a right to be a Green Party or Libertarian or Republican or Democrat at, because you are a human being and me recognizing your humanity, I recognize that you have a right to your political beliefs. What we do not have the right is to actually create and hide the, our beliefs that there are uh, this hierarchy of humanity that in that context and bury that within that political. We have to be able to separate and not collect and collapse the two. That there is one around our political beliefs, but what we have to be unwilling Right. And unwilling to 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 bend on at any level is literally the recognition of each other's humanity, even when there are differences. I often say that I don't think America's problem is that we don't know how to get along. I think America's problem is that we don't know how to differ, that we do not have a context and a paradigm on how do how can we hold space for differing beliefs? How do we create space for, for different ideologies in a way that actually honors each other humanity? That's the vision of the America that I have going forward. That's the vision of America that we should be organizing for, that we should be fighting for. The third point that I want to raise is I think it's really important for us to really recognize, and I always talk about culture. I am a big, I am integrate cultural activism in my work. Culture is a powerful tool. I often say, Culture will eat strategy for breakfast. You can have a really good strategy, right? But if it is not in alignment, and I have many, many stories that I can share around there. I remember one story in particular that I'll just briefly share in Mississippi when I was doing some uh, political work, some philanthropic work, and there was a funder, um, a donor that came into the area and wanted to provide some support and work with this philanthropic collective group. And I got this phone call where the people had gone to this meeting and it would have been a substantial project. No one wanted to work with this group, this particular group. And that's because this, this particular group, the woman who was leading the effort, she showed up at this meeting with these executives of foundations in Mississippi wearing, I, they told me that was like, she had on Crocs. And I was like, what are Crocs? What are you talking about? And she, she, they were talking about Crocs the shoes. And they felt that because she showed up in khaki shorts and Crocs to this executive meeting, that one, that she was literally making a particular statement of what she thought about uh, people in Mississippi. And it was really interesting because the, it was a breath of difference, of diversity within this room. But they all accepted and were very angry because what they felt is they felt disrespected in this process. And so I raised this you know, in this in this way that culture will eat strategy for breakfast. And so it's really important for us to really look at culture, but also look at culture in a way that is about the evolution of humanity and the expansion of humanity, that we, in fact, are not to be held prisoners by the past, that there are some there are some things that we have to evolve, that we have to make space, that just because we've been doing something 100 years does not mean that 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 it is right or that it is applicable to the moment that we have now. And so we've got to really be able to use this space and this time that as we are looking at moving forward, moving forward as a nation, that we literally think it creates space for new cultures to create. That for us to take the culture of how we really communicate and how we understand each other and recognize that there's an opportunity for us to create new cultures that are more inclusive, that are more equitable, that are more just as well. And then the final thing that I'll say as we get through, you know, as I open up, because I'm, I'm really anxious to open up for discussion, uh, for discussion is that I think it's really important for us to take this moment to literally recognize that I know there's a lot of discomfort. You know, we just went through a global pandemic that seems like we are possibly facing even another wave coming, right? That we all are looking at that there's this intensified kind of racialized political environment, right? Very polarizing political environment. And so on one hand, we can look at it and we can look at all that's happening in the world. We can look at the war that is happening in the Ukraine. You know, we can look at all these things that are happening in the world and say, you know what, 
things are really, really, really bad. And yes, there are some elements of things that are happening right now. But I also, I wanted to leave you all to tell you, I want to bring the good news. And the good news is that in this moment, in our darkest moments, historically, in the darkest moments in history, that is when what we have seen is some of the most um, amazing innovation and advancement in, in human humanity, you know, in the, in, in the world. That's what we've seen. And so I just want to offer that in this moment, we lean into the discomfort of what we're feeling in America with the political polarization and that we recommit ourselves by having a radical and holding a radical reimagination around what is possible to create new systems, to create new ways of being, of creating new spaces for us to operate and engage each other in ways that we can really get to that point, to that vision that we seek and that we desire. So as I leave, the five things, I always talk about this, I'm going to leave this with you, that I always, I think there are five opportunities in this moment for us to kind of move forward as we're thinking our imagination. What is it going to take? Number one, it is going to take us having a vision. Going back to that same question, we all should be asking ourselves, if we're not asking ourselves the question around what would America look like without racism, how will we ever get there? How will we ever achieve that when that's not even a thought, a part that is feeding our ideology of what the possibilities that could exist? Right. And so it's going to take vision. The second thing is going to take voice. This is not a moment that we literally can just sit back and say it will work itself out, that we're in a moment. We're in a in a, a defining moment. I think in this nation's history that if any time we needed to literally give voice to what it is that we see and what we desire to create the America that we desire and we deserve, it is going to take us really utilizing our voice, whether that's through our writing, whether that's through writing op-eds, whether that's through having conversations with each other, it is going to require that. The third thing is it's really important for us to not get caught up in the position of politics, but literally center who we are in our ideology in a value system. What is it that we value? If we value our politics more than we value people, there's something fundamentally wrong with that. And so we've got to really be able to shift and make sure that we're being shaped by what our core values are as a human being, as a person. The fourth thing is really around shifting the paradigm of what we see as victory. In this nation, oftentimes we see victory as a zero sum game. In order for me to win, that means you have to lose. We treat we treat politics, which ultimately treats policy of people's lives like it's a Super Bowl. You're either on the blue team or you're on the red team. No, I'm on the humanity team. And so I have to have enough wherewithal. I have to have enough grounding that fundamentally what I am doing is I'm leading into a process that is really being informed by my values and that I'm seeing a victory as how can we get the best possible outcome for all of us? And the fifth and the final thing, I bet you all can figure that V out. Vote. That's right. I said vote. That we have to literally be able to recognize that voting is the most basic foundation for democracy in this nation. And then we see attacks on voting that is not just in isolation around who that helps or who that hurts, but ultimately it hurts and it devolves literally the entire thing when we're talking about having democratic systems that will actually give voice and at least create the space for agency for all of us. In that, I will, I will close right now. Those are my five Vs. I call those the V strategy of how we move forward. And I'm open, very interested and excited about answering any questions. Well, Tasha, thank you so much for this moving, rousing opening. Thank you for your clarity and your conviction for uh, inviting us to reimagine a different world. I want to, we, we know you've been doing this as lifelong work. You're an activist, an organizer, and an artist. I want to ask you about the first time as a, as a child that you saw or felt an injustice that made you want to reimagine a different future. What pulled oh, you into this work? That's an excellent question. You know, there were two times um, that just popped up in my head. One was on a playground. I was in kindergarten. I was in kindergarten. And um, I think it's kind of instructive, too, as I think about it now, as we are um, looking at Easter weekend. I had, uh, just to give some background, I had some white leather patent leather shoes that I received. They were my Easter shoes <laughs> with the little, with the um, socks that had the, the lace around it. Right. And my family could not get me to take those Easter shoes off. I played, they were like my prize and you would scuff them and they would get black scuff marks on them. And so I literally would play in shorts. I would have shorts, jeans. It didn't matter. I was going to put my Easter shoes on. And so I was out on the playground 
And there were these boys. There was a little boy who was a, who was smaller than some of the other boys. And I saw the big boys like really picking on him. And it was interesting because at that moment, I knew I, I my, my initial reaction. That's how I've always been. And I'm the little girl now. And I was a skinny little girl. Right. But I was a skinny little girl in my favorite Easter shoes. And so for a quick I, I was actually decided that I was going to go over there because they shouldn't be messing with that little boy. And for and I paused for a moment because I didn't want to scuff up my shoes. <laughs> I, had, I was like, I don't want to scuff up my shoes. But then I thought about it. I was like, I made a decision. I was willing to scuff up my shoes. And so I went over. Um, I went over, as I think about it now, it's really crazy because those big boys really could have beat me up, but I, I didn't care. Actually, I went over and I jumped in the middle of it and I literally jumped in front would not let them mess with the little boy. And I don't know if they just thought I was a crazy little girl with Easter shoes on and some shorts and a cotton t-shirt and they didn't mess with me. But for whatever reason, it was in that moment that this, this moment that I like my courage, because courage is not in the absence of fear. I want people to recognize that courage is when fear is present. And so in that moment, yes, I was my, my consideration was my shoes, but I was actually fearful because here were three big boys. I'm a I'm a girl. I'm a skinny little girl. And there's this little boy that they're messing with. So I know he can't stand up for me. And so in that moment, what I did is I literally be a, I made a calculated choice that justice Right. That there was a sense of justice. It was not right that they were messing with this little boy. And I was also willing to accept the consequences. The power of good shoes. The power of good <laughs> shoes. Of, of pretty Easter shoes. <laughs> so you had this sense of justice from very early on, even on that playground. And I wonder about your family's history of enslavement in, in Alabama, you growing up in Selma, your childhood there, how that infused the work that you're doing now. How did that kind of carry over into the vision that you see for the world? So my great, 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 four greats removed, great grandmother uh, was named Tilda and she was purchased um, 30 minutes from where I grew up. The irony um, that she was purchased 30 minutes from where I grew up on the port in Mobile, Alabama. Uh, she was uh, purchased by ultimately what wound up being my great, 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 great grand uncle. Um, and taken to Orville, Alabama, where she was taken with her one child. The story in the family is that there were 23 children. All of them were sold. She was allowed to keep one because that was the youngest child. And so she grew up. And in my, my family, you know, the, the interesting story was that, you know, they all lived to be over 100. So she lived to be over 100. Her daughter lived to be 113. Her daughter, with the exception of my great grandmother, lived to be 99, but my grandfather lived to be 104. And so they had longevity, um, which is why I knew them. But what was interesting is they always, I think some sense of justice that, 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 um, uh, that, that shaped something about my family that shaped uh, my belief was that they had decided that at, at one point in, Orva, Alabama, over 115 years ago, um, my grandfather, whose father was Irish and his mother was was African, they married or they lived as husband and wife. I still haven't found the evidence that they were actually married, but they lived as husband and wife. And so they had this belief that they could protect in my family, that you protect the land, that land would be a protection mechanism. And so because of that, I've always had um, this. And, and in that, embedded in that is that this sense of agency, that they always in my family, this value that we had agency and you should be self-determined, but you should be self-contained. That if you had land, you could feed yourself, you could take care of yourself. Nobody could mess with you or engage with you. And so because, and because of that, that had me a strong, that created the strong belief in me around people being self-determined and people mm -hmm. needed space. That there was something about being able to utilize, to have the freedom of your agency, that space would provide that. And so most of my initial organizing was centered around people being able to control their space, having space to have their families, having space to operate, having control of land. And so a lot of that kind of informed my belief around what freedom looked like. For my family, freedom looked like just to be left alone. My family um, never decided, they didn't want to move north. They liked living in the rural deep south, but they also had this belief that if, if they had land and were able to be contained and live off the land, they just wanted to be left alone. And so there was something about that that actually shaped my belief that people had at the very basic right to have, they had the right to be able to have space so that they could actually raise them, themselves, their families. 
So that concept of agency and self-determination inspires you to, to go into politics. You're in your early 20s, you're a single mother, and you want to run at the state level for the Board of Education. I, I know you've talked about not knowing just how much of an uphill battle politics would be, but that you knew how to do one thing, which is organize. And I want to tap into, to try to get people to think about how you started. Where does one begin to do the work of reimagining a different future? Where did you start in your, in your early 20s thinking about this without really knowing much about what you're getting into? Oh, that's an excellent question. I've never been asked that question before. Excellent question. You know, there, uh, as I'm thinking about that election really was a turning point for me. Um, I ran in the, I, listen, I decided to, I wish I say, I wish I could say that I jumped up and decided to run for office. That's not quite how it happened. Actually, what happened is my mentor, I was working for a state senator who was my mentor, who was very politically engaged. And I would do some work, like I always voted and that kind of thing. Right. Uh, but he, um, asked me to run. I was doing a lot of work with young people at the time. I was working at a youth organization and I did a lot of youth development work. And at the time there was a lawsuit in the state of Alabama where, where schools in the Black Belt region, where there's a majority of African-American students and, and districts that high, had high African-American populations, they were funded at a, at a um, there was an inequity in, in the funding structure of how those schools were funded in majority white districts. And so literally I saw that as an opportunity to raise the issue. I don't even think if I thought about winning at the time. Now, you know, because of the nature of who I am, you know, I want to win because <laughs> that's what we do. Right. <laughs> you know, so I wanted to win. But my what drove me to the process wasn't really about thinking about winning. It was literally I wanted to be of service. I wanted to create this space and use this platform to raise these issues of what were happening in these districts, um, these school districts with African-American students. You know, it was in the course. There were so many lessons that I learned in the course of um of me running that that even the next time that I ran um informed kind of how I approached that but one in the in the course of me doing this what I really realized I approached it from engaging people I always thought that who would give me power would be people I never thought that I was a savior my approach wasn't I am the savior and I'm the smartest person running for office and you all need me I did the opposite. I felt like I needed people. And so I organized from that perspective. Let's get this seat for us. Right. Mm -hmm. And so from that from that space of kind of not knowing, you know, maybe it was a good thing that I didn't know, because I, probably if I knew the magnitude of what I was up against, maybe I would not have done it. You know, but but I but I ran. I didn't have any money run for office. Like I said, I was probably the the candidate. I was the the anti candidate, right? I was a candidate. I was young, work, running against a twelve year incumbent. I was a woman, and that was significant. I didn't know it was significant until I started going around to black churches, and they made me speak from the floor because they said I couldn't speak from the pulpit because I was a woman. And I had never it it opened up my eyes to sexism. Um, and the next time I ran, I decided to lean into. So what I would do is I would often take those negatives that were put on me and I would actually lean into them and then it takes the power away from your opponent. So the, the whole notion of me being a candidate, being a woman, what I did is I was like, you know what? I ran next time I ran for the, uh, the house, uh, a house seat. I literally made my whole campaign a feminine campaign. I almost, my, my mentor almost gave him a heart attack. I changed my colors to pink. And he was like, you're running a campaign with pink. He was like, that's crazy. Like, why, why would you do that? Instead of blue, white, and red, I'd lean into it. I actually walked around only in pink suits. I was very girly. I literally, and then my phrase was, what's the best place for a woman is in the house. And so I leaned into it, which actually activated the base. Um, mm -hmm. But to get back to this particular race, in this particular race, the outcome actually was transformative to me as well. And so maybe a couple of days, maybe a week or two, um, a couple of weeks before the election, I just started getting money. I went and met with one of the most powerful lobbyists in the um, in the state, and he gave me a ten thousand dollars check. And I was completely confused why he would give me that much money. And then I started getting checks, and then it came out. Then I realized that I I was leading a AP poll, and literally I came out of nowhere. And it was really around tapping into organizing and connecting with the people who had done the work, the ecosystem. So even my work I do now is informed by I will never forget. Here I am a underdog candidate, a young candidate did not know what I was doing. I didn't know the the I didn't have the political favoring that 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 my opponent had. But what I had is I knew how to build infrastructure because I knew how to organize. 
I mean, well, I knew how to do both because there, there's some distinction, but I knew how to organize would help me actually be able to build out this ecosystem. And then just to fast forward it, you know, this this race wound up being so close out of 80 something thousand votes um, that it wound up uh, willing down to less than 117 votes. And so I thought that I had lost the race. I accepted. I conceded. it. And then seven days later, when they were confirming the race, I got a phone call from the head of the Democratic Party asking and apologizing profusely. He's like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, Latasha, to tell you this. But in Wilcox County, the sheriff said that he just found that the, the race was confirmed at 12 o'clock. At 12.04, the sheriff of Wilcox County remembered that he had 800 ballots that he had placed up in the safe. And so in my naivety, I was like, oh, well, that's good because Wilcox County is a county that I carry. So certainly the votes were cast before the election ended. They were secured by an election for, um, official. So they're, certainly they're going to count the votes. There was never even a thought for me that they wouldn't count the votes. It was like, no, I'm sorry. The race has been certified, so we're not going to count the votes. And I felt completely powerless. I remember that moment that I, that I had worked hard. I had done all this work. And if I had just lost because I lost the race, I accepted that. But mm -hmm. to be stolen, being taken from me. And so that was kind of like my first engagement around voter suppression. And to this day, that very thing that seemed as a loss was really opened up a whole space for me around the work that I do around voter suppression. That was over 23 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. And so it informed how I moved forward. It informed, and then I realized how common it was. Um, that experience was common, not only with me, but other places, particularly in the rural South. I love that you took what, what was a loss on the face of it and zoomed out and made it not about you, but about the bigger system. And now this is the work that you're doing with, with getting black voters to, to vote and to fight against voter suppression. Now, I want to talk about a really big historic first that happened just last week. We got the confirmation of Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson, and I'm sure you were watching the confirmation hearings. And I think one of the most moving parts of it is she tells, uh, tells a story about being here at Harvard in 1988 as an undergraduate student. You know, she says she grew up in public schools, was feeling very out of her element at, a, at an Ivy League institution like this one. And she's walking across Harvard Yard just outside my window here. And a black woman that she didn't even know, a complete stranger to her, just leans over and says, persevere. Mm -hmm. And she was moved to tears when she was telling that story. And I wonder, when you heard that story, what, how did that resonate with you? This message from an unknown black woman who just saw another black woman and said that one word. How did that sit with you? You know, even now to speak on it, I'm full. Um, it struck me because I knew so many of us have had that woman. I know I have. I don't, that, that same black woman has showed up in my life several times, right? She has shown up in my life when I thought um, that I couldn't continue because I had failed at something. She showed up in my life to say, baby, you can do it. She showed up in my life as a friend. She showed up in my life as a grandmother. She showed up in my life as a teacher that told me when I said that I wanted to be an opera singer and my own family was laughing at me, was like, baby, you can absolutely do that. And she introduced me to Lentine Price, who I had never heard of, and Marian Anderson. I had never heard of these women, right? And so part of it is, you know, when we look at life, we judge our life by, you know, where we have these high points, right? Where is it those high points when in fact, we're all just on a journey, that this is part of the ebbs and flows of who we are. It is a journey. Just as I see this nation, America, we're on a journey, but we also have the agency to be able to shape that journey. And sometimes it's just that little word, that mm -hmm. little moment. In that moment, what she did is she kind of activated, she catalyzed um, what what I, what the judge felt. She cat catalyzed what Katanji was feeling in that moment, that there was a part of her that could feel the truth in it, that I just need to persevere. And sometimes you just need somebody to say, you can do it, baby, you can do it. And mm -hmm. so I raise that because I think what's important for 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 um for me in that space is that we find those spaces to give each other grace and space that we mm -hmm. give each other the grace and the opportunity. We're all going to mess up. We all are going to at some point feel insecure. It doesn't matter if you got a PhD mm -hmm. or you're dropping. We all have moments that we feel insecure. And, but literally when we go back to our humanity, to our core and really recognize this is just kind of a journey. This is like a part of the human journey and have people that are in our ear, people that are on our path 
that encourage us, that inspire us, that it literally can give us just another, that, that little wind under our wings to kind of move forward. You know, I was at the White House um, last week um, when she spoke at the White House, and I can't even describe mm -hmm. what I was feeling there. When she actually said the, um, uh, when she said the part, when she said my answer, when she said, I am a hope and a, and a dream of a slave, and my, I had chills because that's who I am. That's who I am. I am a hope and a dream of a slave. And I knew exactly what she meant, that literally she recognized that in that that who I am right now is not divorced from my past, nor is it like literally just limiting me around in this moment, no matter how phenomenal it is in this moment, that there are places that I can go, that there are ways that I can evolve. There are ways that I can change and move forward. And so sometimes I really believe that if we literally shift it, in this country from this, this idea of that we're being driven by our political ideology and literally replace that with being driven by our humanity and mm -hmm. recognizing that our ideology should come out of that or be informed by that, how much greater, how much more inclusive, how much more just would the world be? Mm -hmm. And speaking of inclusion and justice, so I think the moment, you know, this persevere moment with, with uh, Judge Brown Jackson, was so poignant because so many of us know what it's like to be in institutions and places that are not built for us, that are not designed for us in mind, where we feel like outsiders. And I wonder what would it look like to reimagine a place like Harvard to be a place, not just where a black woman has to persevere, but a place where she can thrive. What would it look like to reimagine Harvard as a place where that is the, the default, thriving instead of persevering against Listen, I'm, I, and I'm saying this, and it's not hyperbole. I, I'm saying this because I really believe this, that if Harvard is to survive, it must reimagine itself. That the bottom line is we are, that, that what we know is when species do not evolve and adapt, you know, in fact, they become extinct. And so I think it's really important. I think the level of, 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 the richness of the students. I love Harvard students. That's part of my love for being in the Harvard community. You know, I think that having the brain trust, the, the brilliance, I think having the ideas there, having the freedom of space there, like literally, I think that the students, I think the faculty, but particularly the students, I think that's the greatest resource in that institution, right? To the point that anything in the institution, like should be a be changed to meet what it is as greatest resource, which is the people and the students that are there. That is what gives validity to the, the school. And so I think that we sometimes we attach ourselves to, you know, the, the, the glory days of the past without recognizing the pain of the past. Right. That we have to acknowledge that at one point, Harvard did not allow women to attend. At one point, uh, Harvard did not allow students of color to attend. Right. At one point, Harvard did not allow international um, folks from particular places to attend. And so I'm raising that that part of it that Harvard has become it, it becomes better when we literally recognize that change is a gift, that when we are literally operating in our reimagination of what, the, what that college could be. And so that's why I talk about culture, that we have to start looking at culture as that's not a, that we don't have to look at culture as a fixed fact, that we can look at culture is all culture is, is a way that literally human beings have created this, these, these different ways to interact and to, and to navigate and to, to engage one another. That we perfectly, the Harvard community has the authority, has the ability to shift the culture in such a way that we're not just looking at diversity and inclusion, like we're injecting a vaccine, like, okay, we have this Harvard thing and we're going to inject some diversity and inclusion, but with that we're literally looking at the, the possibilities and the power that exists when we're transforming the institution to be an institution that has actually evolved, that has gone to a higher level around its value of human life, that has gone at a higher level of its value of that literally diversity is not the, the extra thing that we add, it's not the ketchup on the french fries, but that diverse that diversity in itself becomes the meat, that we see that the power, that we see that the value of the institution is to have this brain trust of diverse ideas, diverse ideologies, of people who bring a certain low set of learnings to the uh, to the to to this institution, a different approaches to research, a different approaches to being able, how we gather information how do we how do we literally be able to do different pedagogies that at the end of the day mm -hmm. i think it's really important to have different pedagogies i think it's really important for us to shift this narrative around 
what diversity and inclusion is, that we look at diversity and inclusion as it's something external to be included in what exists. We should literally be able to look at what does it have, what does it mean to actually your foundation, that your base, the nucleus of your cell is actually diversity, right? And inclusion and equity. Everything that will grow out of that could, can't help but to actually create more space create more space and literally bring us on a trajectory that actually those things that we desire, that we're saying when we want an institution that's really diverse and an institution that has inclusion, that that is not just a based on a propaganda position, but that is really rooted in a principle and a principle um, for the institution. And that's going to require change. And it's going to require Harvard and the leadership of Harvard to have the courage, to have the insight and the imagination to be able to change the institution, to be the kind of institution that is reflective of those beliefs that all human beings have value and should be respected and honored. Yes, this, you know, I almost developed an allergy to the word diversity um, yes. uh, over the last, I mean, forever, but especially over the last two years in the wake of George Floyd's murder, we saw so many organization, corporations, industries flocking to new diversity, equity and inclusion statements. Um, and two years in, I think many of us have seen kind of the shallowness, the performativeness of it, um, how it lacks substance. And, you know, I think the word that we don't talk about when we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, and we have so many people in the room right now, in the virtual room listening, that fundamentally, to me, this is not just about, you know, surface cherry on top statements. We're really talking about power structures and how things are created. And so how do we get past, Latasha, I mean, you've, you, this is like your lifelong work. You have literally changed power structures in states, in, in you know, the way people vote. How do we um, reimagine what DEI means in a place like Harvard with all the uh, resources, the access that it has? How do we go about actually talking about power and how it's structured in a place like Harvard? You know, one of the reasons why I fight it, I organize around democracy, because I think democracy is also approach of sharing power. And so I think you can democratize some processes that ultimately I think students and those that that when, when we start creating um, different avenues to be able to have different voices that are actually shaping the policies. I think that that is one obvious way that is available for us. I think if we want to see um, if we want to see change. Like you can't drive the change and you don't change yourself, right? Mm -hmm. That it is going to require change is hard. The truth of the matter is we're all change is hard for all of us. I, I often tell the story around how I literally went to my grocery store and they changed the spice out and I almost had a heart attack. I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. And I'm a change agent, right? So change is hard, but I do think that we can actually approach it in a way that we can approach it in a way that what we're doing is we're creating, we're democratizing these processes that we're providing up. I often say grace and space that we're creating. And, and, and as I said earlier, my attachment to space with my family, space and agency, I've seen where space and agency can actually be transformative. And so we've got to really be able to create more spaces and opportunities for students, for faculty to literally be able to engage, to shape in shape the, of the programs, to shape in the thinking, to shape in the policy of the institution. I think the one, one beautiful thing about Harvard is Harvard is the most resource institution in the entire world. And so the resources are available there. The brain power is available there. The students and the, some of the most brilliant faculty in the world are there. The, what, what, what we have to ask the question, do we have the political will? Do we have the political will to be a leader? Just as Harvard has been a leader in the Ivy Leagues, just as, as uh, Harvard has been a leader in the academy, as in research and producing um, um, uh, thought leadership and researchers and the best um, thinkers and institution builders, Harvard does have an opportunity to actually lead in that space. And what that is going to require is that's going to require literally of thinking as you talk about this power differential, right? That we've got to really think about how is there a sharing of power? How is there a sharing of are we bringing and are we creating? How are we looking at the tenure process with, with, with faculty? Are we creating space for there to be real diversity? Not that we're just interjecting like it's some vaccine. We're gonna put it, we're gonna interject, we're gonna put a we're gonna put a black person here, we're gonna put a Latino here, and that's gonna work it. But how do we where it really translates and it really we transforms this space where it becomes a fundamental value of the institution? How do we create processes that we are able to let go some things that yes, this has been what we've done for a while. This has been 
the history of what we've done and really recognize that the time and the season for that particular culture or that particular thing has run its course, that in fact it is harmful and not helpful. And I think that the only way that we do that, whether that's with governments, whether that's with institutions, whether that's with Harvard, is that if we start from the question, and this is my firm belief, if we start from the principle that our sole purpose as, a, uh, as an institution, as an academy, right, is to literally be at the center of how do we advance humanity, that if we really operate from that as a principal belief and let that allow us to shape, and yes, is Harvard going to get it wrong? Absolutely. I get things wrong daily, right? Mm -hmm. That we're on, but, but I do think that if we are moving in a direction, that we're moving way past this idea of diversity, and, and inclusion in this very limited sense, right? And literally start seeing the transformational opportunity that this moment is opening up for us. That as we're seeing the global world become smaller, as we're seeing communications, that we're able to connect with each other, that we're able to actually share information all around the world. As we see, I, I would, I want to see Harvard be a leader in this space. Right. Not just because of the institution itself, I think, it grow and grow and, and be better. But Harvard is a leader in the world. And so I think a institution much who is given, much is required. That is a Bible verse that my grandmother used to say. Now, I'm not saying that 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 Harvard is a lot uh, makes itself aligned to that same belief as I. But I do believe that it is a worthy principle. I think it's a principle around humanity that as an institution, as an institution, that it is the most endowed institution, that is the most resourced institution in the world, that it has a particular responsibility of literally standing and being a leader in a space. Right. And at least in a space and in many ways in many instances it has not been a leader in and that how do we literally correct course course correct in a way that we're literally being a leader and not just in the field of business not in just the field of politics not just in the field of the academy but how can harvard be a leader in the advancement of humanity how can uh, harvard be a global leader of literally creating the tone and being a part of that that group of us who have the audacity to believe that we can create the kind of global community that we desire and we deserve um, for people listening in, we're going to take questions in, in just a couple of minutes. So if you haven't been already doing so, please put them in the chat so I can put them to Latasha. Um, Latasha, I mean, you have talked about the toll and the cost of being a change maker, specifically as a Black person for Black leaders and Black organizations, the very real risk of doing the work and changing power structures. And you have faced some pretty serious risks in so doing. I mean, I, I know that at one point, one of the Airbnbs you were staying in was set on fire. And that is an extreme, I think, um, example of the toll of doing this work and the energy that it that it requires. For people who are feeling maybe um, exhausted or scared, or, you know, they're up against it in the work that they're trying to do and reimagining their work, their communities, their industries, how have you persevered? How do you find the energy to keep going despite very real risks to you and your safety and your own humanity as you're pushing for everybody else's humanity? Oh, you got wonderful questions. I love these questions. Um, there are a couple of thoughts. The first thought that comes to me, to mind for me is because I don't think of change as transactional and I think of it as transformative, I think about my work as being a part of protracted struggle. Right. That there is an element of the work that I do that I recognize that parts of it I may not ever see in my lifetime. Right. But I also recognize that I'm here having this conversation with you at an institution that my ancestors helped build. Right. Um, and 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 we're not even a part of the process, could not go there. But it was someone who had a dream somewhere and had the audacity to believe and to imagine that created a pathway for me to find myself in this position, just as you, sister. And so I'm raising that because I think it's really important, you know, for people to recognize when I'm talking about reimagining, that's not just for um, the sake of, you know, sometimes there are these efforts. And I hate these workshops that are around innovation for innovation's sake. I, you know, I mean, I, I don't know if I, I mean, some people have time for that. I don't have time for it. Right? Like, you know, that's not, that's not what I have time for. But I think that, and, I, and I'm not one of those people that believe just because something is new, that is better. That's not what mm -hmm. I believe, nor do I believe that all innovation is good. That's not what I believe. What I do believe, though, is that when you tap into imagination allows you to go to a higher plane, and your thinking, it allows you 
to to operate without boundaries around being able uh, around what is possible. It allows you to explore possibilities of what could be right. And oftentimes, part of what I've seen, those who burn out in the work, I think it, it is impo- it would be impossible for me mm-hmm. um, to do this work and not just be crazy and bitter and angry all the time without being creative. Right. Part of what creative creativity allows me to do one, sometimes it allows me to escape. But a lot of times part of the reason why I sing, like I open up singing, like I'll sing is because singing has an interesting way. It is a porter for me to tap into my humanity. At the end of the day, when I don't have the thoughts, when I don't have the ideas, when I am stuck I, and I sing, there's something new that's being birthed. Even if it's an old song that I've sang 25,000 times, I've never mm-hmm. sang that song this way. Every time I sing it, it's a new fingerprint. It's a new way. There's something. And so it gives me access to what is deep in me, but it also gives me access to this idea that I can always create something new, that I can always create in the moment. Right. And that I uh, and I have agency. And there's something about that that actually drives me. The second thing that drives me and this may sound, you know, this may sound a little fluffy to people, but it really is. I am a love bug. I call myself a love ambassador. If I don't believe in anything else, when I and when I'm not able to believe in politics, when I'm like, we just need to throw all of this in the river. Right. When sometimes I'm even challenging my own political ideology, what I am always anchored in. I think you have to have some belief that you are in value that you're anchored in. You know, I kind of think of it as like a tree. I talk about this in different areas. You can, it's applicable to me. You can go to racism, you go to other pieces. You know, a tree will survive if you break off the branches. Like the, the leaves can fall, it'll still be a tree, it'll still be alive. The branches can break off, it'll still be a tree. The trunk can still there. But when you, the moment you uproot, that tree no longer is alive. And so what are your roots grounded in your roots? That tree has to be attached in the ground, right? So it can receive its nutrients so that it can actually be anchored. And so I think that we have to have something that anchors us. And so for me, I think the piece that can anchor us all um, is this concept of love. And I don't mean love in the sense of the romantic love, even though that's great too. Sometimes that makes you feel anchored. Sometimes that makes you not feel anchored, right? Mm -hmm. But (laughs) but this whole notion of love, and I mean in terms of the full spectrum of that, then can actually anchor you that when nothing else fails, when when I don't think that I'm pretty, when I don't think that I'm smart, I think if I can stand with this belief that I'm worthy of love, Right. That grows my politics that that makes my well, if I'm worthy of love, then I'm worthy to be treated as a human be- uh, being. I'm worthy to be respected that I'm worthy. And so for me, the other piece for me is love. And then the and the third and the final space for me is art. You know, there's something about art. Sometimes when I am like stuck, I go to a museum. And I literally just go into a museum and and look at art. It's something about art. It reinforces this idea of possibilities for me. Latasha, thank you so much for um, injecting the realm of possibility of reimagination of a different future, of thinking outside of the world that we already live in and creating a different world. It has been so amazing to speak to you. Thank you for closing out this amazing session. And I want to um, uh, invite Sherry back in to close us out and say a final thank you. Wow, I wish that I could um, ask everybody to unmute themselves and just give you um, a rousing standing ovation. This is one of those times when, um, you know, the Zoom platform, or in this case, the digital platform does not serve us. But if you could see all the comments and the affirmations um, in the chat, um, I mean, it, the, the outpouring of love and appreciation um, has been phenomenal, but obviously it was also very clear that uh, the conversation itself was so generative and challenged us um, to really think deeply about what it is that we're doing here, moving beyond just making diversity, the ketchup on the fries. People were talking about that in the chat, (laughs) Um, but thinking about deep transformational work here. Um, And so I thank you. I learned so much in this conversation. Um, It was absolutely phenomenal. And I will tell you, Latasha, I almost needed a, 
a warning that you were going to sing. I did not know that. Um, I was so happy that I didn't have to come back on screen because I was like, oh my goodness, I, I, you you brought tears to my tears to my eyes today. Um, but thank you all so much. Thank you all so much for pricking our consciousness and for asking us the difficult, tough questions. Um, and thank you both for all of the work that you do. Uh, well, we have reached uh, the end of our time together today um, and uh, the end of this fantastic three day forum. Um, thank you to everyone who's engaged with us over the last three days on these critical EDIB topics from race conscious admissions to inclusive symbols and spaces to challenging our biases on professionalism and how people learn uh, to restorative justice to navigating difficult conversations. We've had nearly 2,000 members of the Harvard community engaging with one another, learning together over the course of the last three days. Um, none of this would have been possible without the leadership of our forum co-chairs, Dr. Alexis Stokes and Annabella Morabito, who you heard from throughout the conference. Um, Annabella um, is our tech guru, producer extraordinaire who has been holding this together behind the scenes. Um, and both of them together um, with the support of the entire EDIB team and office and the cross campus forum planning committee members um, brought what I think is um, an absolutely excellent offering um, to our campus community. So if you please would just put in the chat your thanks and gratitude for them for what they do for our community. I really want to also thank the Cross Campus Forum Planning Committee members, um, Adam Beaver, Ashley Sandoval from the Box Center, Naisha Bradley and Alice Catherine Swan from the Graduate School of Design, um, Dean Altamoro from Harvard College, um, Brooke Livingston, um, the DEI chair for the Undergraduate Council of Harvard College, got to thank our students. Um, Daniela Hernandez, um, also a graduate student um, from Harvard Graduate School of Education. Um, Frenny Polanco Walters from Harvard Medical School. Um, one, our team member, um, Hannah Omiya um, from the Office of Equity, Diversity, Inclusion and Belonging. Um, Dr. Yvonne Garcia, um, if you didn't get a chance to listen to her talk today on anti-racist education, do your a favor and listen to it. It was fantastic. Um, from um, Hugsy, um, Kate Kutulek from UDR, um, University Disability Resources, uh, Sheree o Dean Sheree Ohen, um, and Marin Greathouse from the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Um, both did excellent sessions today. Also, check them out. Melissa Tarr from um, the Office of the Provost, Office of the Vice Provost for Advances in Learning. Um, Thank you, Melissa. Shirley Green from Division of Continuing Education. Um, Travis Allen Johnson um, from the college, um, for, from the college, one of our students, and also Xavier Saeed, um, gra a graduate student from the Harvard Divinity School. Um, I wanted to call you all by name because it is it, this work um, would not be possible without you all and without the support of this great community. Um, we are now at Thursday. We started this journey together on Tuesday with President Bacow, um, really challenging us to work together to increase a sense of belonging. And, um, you know, I, I think it's no surprise that the theme of belonging came up several times in several, several different ways throughout our time together. Um, we heard Lauren Ridloff, who was phenomenal, um, a phenomenal actress and activist, really challenged us, I think, to do the deep work of placing ourselves in uncomfortable spaces and really leaning into the work of building a world where we don't see um, a person with a disability as a person who's disadvantaged. Um, I think we had multiple conversations over the course of the past few days about um, the work of inclusion. Um, we spent all of Tuesday talking about, all of Wednesday, excuse me, um, talking about race conscious admissions and the work that we're doing there. Um, and the, the work of actually um, not only building a community, um, but the work of building a community that is tied to its values. You know, in my conversation with Professor Cornell William Brooks and Bill Lee both, um, we both spoke about the confirmation of Justice uh, Katanji Brown Jackson um, with, you know, with much glee. And I remember Professor Brooks, Brooks noting in that conversation that we should really be talking about the fact that a person 
of Justice Brown Jackson's caliber and character has really come from this community. Um, as I was reflecting on that and I was thinking about that, I was thinking about a conversation I was having with a colleague and we were talking about um, this quote that has now become famous um, when she described her experience walking across Harvard Yard and um, an anonymous black woman saw her head hanging low and said to her to persevere. That moment was so interesting to me. And um, one of my colleagues said, how many times have we been walking across campus and someone who is otherwise invisible, the members of the staff who do the work has seen us, has seen a student, saw them for who they were, perhaps interpreted the fact that her head was down and understood and read her body language and gave her the courage that she needed to go on to these great heights. It really touched me and it reminded me of the work of so many of our staff that often goes unseen. And so I want to say to all of our staff who are joining us today, thank you. Um, you are seen, your work is seen and your work is valued. And thank you for what you do to create this place of exploration and opportunity for all of our students. Um, really, you are the backbone of this institution um, as our new uh, vice president for uh, human resources, um, Manuel said this morning. Um, you know, Latasha challenged us today to go deeper into our imagination, to imagine the possibilities of not only what this nation could look like, but also what this university could look like. Um, she said it over and over, this is how we transform. This is how we do the work. If we have the courage to imagine the possibilities. Now, I think if we couple that with what Professor Cornell William Brooks told us yesterday, that Harvard is a metaphor for the nation, then we really understand what it is that we're doing here, the importance of this work, understanding that what we build here leaves here and has the potential to set the pace for what's happening in the rest of the country. So now here we are um, at the end of our three days together. I can't believe it. Um, and even though we're at the end, we're only at the beginning, the beginning of actually doing the work, of starting to do the work of making Harvard the place we know it can be. Yeah, I joked in my conversation with Bill um, yesterday um, that I wanted to start a campaign. My team knows that this is the truth. Um, it's saying something along the lines of, Harvard, girl, you look good for 385 years old. And we do. We have the most diverse staff, student body, faculty, and alumni group that we've ever had. And the thing that I am most proud of is that even though we don't get it right all the time, we are constantly working to be a better version of ourselves today than we were yesterday. We're taking affirmative steps to think about rebuilding our community. We saw that in our conversation starting on Tuesday with um, Professor Danielle Allen, who led the task force on inclusion and belonging and the work that was happening, not only in the medical school, but also in the FAS. We have seen in the past few weeks, the campus release, um, our, our new anti-discrimination, anti-bullying policies, anti-sexual harassment policies that are out for public comment. We've seen the work of the committee to articulate principles on renaming that has given us the principles that we need to guide decisions about how we memorialize and remember those in our community and when we might choose to do something different. The Harvard and the Legacy of Slavery Initiative, something that we, I think, should all be incredibly grateful and proud of, is working to really uncover Harvard's connection to slavery, but not just uncover it, hopefully to give us some answers about what the pathway forward looks like. There is so much to be proud of here, and I am so grateful um, that not only are we doing the work on campus, but that our work has not just been limited to our campus, our fight to defend race conscious admissions is as much about Harvard as it is about higher education and our, our commitment to diversity and access. As Bill told us yesterday, diversity is on trial here and we will vigorously fight to defend it because this is about our ability to create the kind of community, to create the beloved community that we would like to see. So in the coming days, I ask you to think about how you will take what you've learned here with you. 
Um, there are several ways that I think we can continue the work and I'm gonna just give you my thoughts. The first is to ask yourself, what are the concrete ways that we can take what you have learned, what we have all learned out into the world with us, into our offices, our homes, our classrooms, our chat groups, um, maybe even, even around the holiday tables that many of us will have in the coming days, sometimes with family. Um, and sometimes not with, but with other loved ones who we might disagree. And maybe you pull up some of those um, nuggets we learned about how to have difficult conversations from Sheree Owens' chat. I mean, from Sheree Owens' session, I would definitely say uh, check out Sheree Owens' section, session. The second thing is how can, ask yourself, how can you provide feedback or engage with upcoming or ongoing campus initiatives? There will be several opportunities. I already mentioned the anti-discrimination, anti-bullying, anti-sexual harassment policies that are out for public comment. The Reimagining Campus Safety Initiative. Thank you um, um, to Manuel and to Chief Clay um, for leading that session. Um, it was launched here at the forum. Continue to join the conversation. Harvard and the Legacy of Slavery is hosting its conference at Radcliffe on the 29th. The HNLS committee led by Dean Tomiko Brown-Nagin has really provided programming for the Harvard community for the last two years with the committee set to release its report this spring. As Professor Danielle Allen said in um, our conversation on Tuesday, in referencing how we remember and memorialize the past, our task is really to acknowledge our history while putting our faces to the future. And that's what we're doing through that initiative. So I encourage you to take advantage of that offering. And then finally, join us in our community and affinity spaces. There will be an opportunity for you to, um, to sign up to join us on the 28th at noon. Um, check out our website there. Finally, in a couple of days, um, or maybe right after the conference, you should receive a link to a survey um, that will allow you to give us feedback. This will be an annual offering. And so the last thing I ask of you is that each one reach one. Give us feedback so that we can get better and then come back next year because this is going to be an ongoing annual event. We will continue to partner together with you to reimagine our community. This is ongoing work. I say this all the time. This is ongoing work that must be dynamic. It is not my responsibility or your responsibility alone. It is our responsibility in order for all of us to build a place that is truly representative of who we want to become. And that means we need all members of our community to participate. So next year, I ask each of you to invite a colleague. So that said, um, we've reached the end of our time. And in the spirit of reimagining, I ask you, just like I said, Harvard, you look good for 385. I ask you, you Harvard, um, because I always say that um, Harvard is so much more than its buildings. What will you look like at 400? This is the question I want us to sit with um, because it's the people. It's the people, us, you, me. So I ask you, I ask us, who will we be at 400? So as we leave in pondering the answer to this question, um, myself, who will we be at 400? I heard the words of another one of our students, Amanda Gorman, ringing in my subconscious, and I thought I'd close with a section of her inauguration poem, The Hill We Climb. So let us leave behind a country better than the one we were left. With every breath from my bronze pounded chest, we will raise this wounded world into a wondrous one. We will rise from the golden hills of the West, we will rise from the windswept Northeast where our forefathers first realized revolution. We will rise from the lake rimmed cities of the Midwestern states. We will rise from the sun baked South. We will rebuild, reconcile and recover. In every known nook of our nation, in every corner called our country, our people diverse and beautiful will emerge battered and beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it, for there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it.
if only we're brave enough to be it. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you next year. Have a wonderful rest of your day.